The Problem of Thor Bridge. Somewhere in the vaults of the Bank of Cox and Co. at Charing Cross, there is a travel-worn and battered tin dispatch box with my name, John H. Watson, M.D., late Indian Army, painted upon the lid. It is crammed with papers, nearly all of which are records of cases to illustrate the curious problems which Mr. Sherlock Holmes had at various times to examine. Some, and not the least interesting, were complete failures, and such will hardly bear narrating, since no final explanation is forthcoming. A problem without a solution may interest the student, but can hardly fail to annoy the casual reader. Among these unfinished tales is that of Mr. James Fillimore, who, stepping back into his own house to get his umbrella, was never more seen in this world. No less remarkable is that of the cutter Alicia, which sailed one spring morning into a small patch of mist from where she never again emerged, nor was anything further heard of herself or her crew. A third case worthy of note is that of Isadora Persano, the well-known journalist and duelist, who found a stark, st who was found stark staring mad with a matchbox in front of him, which contained a remarkable worm, said to be unknown to science. Apart from these unfathomed cases, there are some which involve the secrets of private families to an extent which would mean consternation in many exalted quarters if it were thought possible that they might find their way to print. I need not say that such a breach of confidence is unthinkable and that these records will be separated and destroyed now that my friend has had time to return his energies to the matter. There remain a considerable residue of cases of greater and less interest, which I might have edited before I had not feared to give the public a surfeit, which might react upon the reputation of the man whom all above others I revere. And some I was myself concerned and can speak as an eyewitness, while in others I was neither present nor played a small part, or parts that they could only be told by a third person. The following narrative is drawn from my own experience. It was a wild morning in October, and I observed I was dressing how the last remaining leaves were being whirled from the solitary plane tree which graces the yard behind our house. I descended to breakfast, prepared by my own companion and deserted spirits, for, like all artists, he was easily impressioned by his surroundings. On the contrary, I found that he had nearly finished his meal, and that his mood was particularly bright and joyous, with that somewhat sinister cheerfulness which is characteristic of his lighter moments. You have a case, Holmes, I remarked. The difficulty of deduction is certainly contagious, Watson, he answered. It has enabled you to probe my secret. Yes, I have a case. After a month of trivialities and stagnation, which wheels once more. Might I share it? There is little to share, but we may discuss it. When you have consumed the two hard-boiled eggs with which our new cook has favored us, that condition may not be unconnected with the copy of the Family Herald which I observed yesterday upon the hall table. Even so trivial a matter as cooking an egg demands the attention which the conscious of the passage of time, and incompatible with the love romance in an excellent periodical. A quarter of an hour later, the table had been cleared and we were face to face. He had drawn a letter from his pocket. You have heard of Neil Gibson, the Gold King, he said. You mean the American senator? Well, he was once senator of some western state, but it is better known that the greatest gold mining magnate in the world. Yes, I know of him. He has surely lived in England for some time. His name is very familiar. Yes, he bought a considerable estate in Hampshire some five years ago. Possibly you have already heard of the tragic end of his wife. 
Of course, I remember it now. That was why the name was familiar, but I know nothing about the details. Holmes waved his hand towards some papers on a chair. I've had no idea that the case was coming my way, or I should have had my extracts ready, he said. The fact is that the problem, though exceedingly sensational, appeared to present no difficulty. The interesting personality of the accused does not obscure the clearness of the evidence. That was the view taken by the coroner's jury and also by the police court proceedings. It is now referred to the assizes at Winchester. I fear that it is a thankless business. I can discover facts, Watson, but I cannot change them. Unless some entirely new and unexpected ones come into light, I do not see what my client can hope for. Your client? Ah, I had forgot. I had not told you. I am getting into your involved habit, Watson, of telling a story backwards. You had best read this first. <clears throat> The letter which he handed me, written in a bold, masterful hand, ran as follows. October 3rd, Claridge's Hotel. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I can't see the best woman God ever made go to her death without doing all that is possible to save her. I can't explain things. I can't even try to explain things. But I know beyond all doubt that Mrs. Dunbar is innocent. You know the facts. Who doesn't? It has been the gossip of the country and never a voice raised for her. It's damned injustice of what... Oh, it makes me crazy. That woman has a heart that wouldn't let her kill a fly. Oh. I'll come at eleven tomorrow and see if you can get some ray of light in the dark. Maybe I have a clue and don't know it. Anyhow, all I know is all I can have, and I know I am sure of your use if only you can save her. If you ever in your life you showed your powers, put them now into this case. Yours faithfully, J. Neil Gibson. There you have it, said Sherlock Holmes, knocking out the ashes from his after-breakfast pipe and slowly refilling it. That is the gentleman I await. As to your story, you have hardly time to master all these papers. So I must give it to you in a nutshell if you are to make an intelligent interest in the proceedings. This man is the greatest financial power in the world, and a man, as I understand, a most violent and formidable character. He married a wife, the victim of this tragedy, of whom I know nothing save that she was past her prime, which was the more unfortunate as a very attractive governess superintended the education of her two children. These are three people concerned and the scene is a grand old manor house, the center of a historical English estate. Then, as to the tragedy, the wife was found in the grounds nearly half a mile from the house, late at night, clad in her dinner dress, with a shawl over her shoulders and a revolver bullet through her brain. No weapon was found near her, and there was no local clue as to the murder. No weapon near her, Watson. Mark that. The crime seems to be have committed late in the evening, and the body was found by a gameskeeper at eleven o'clock, when it was examined by the police and by a doctor before being carried away to the house. It was too condensed. Or can you follow it clearly? It is very clear. But why suspect the governess? Well, in the first place, there is some very direct evidence. A revolver with one discharge chamber of the caliber which corresponded with the bullet was found on the floor of her wardrobe. His eyes fixed, and he repeated the broken words. On the floor of her wardrobe. Then he sank into silence, and I saw that some train of thought had been set moving, which I should be foolish to interrupt. Suddenly, with a start, he emerged into brisk life once more. Yes, Watson, that is found. Pretty damning, eh? So the two juries thought... And then the dead woman had a note upon her, making an appointment at that very place and signed by the governess. How's that? Finally, there is a motive. Senator Gibson is a very attractive person. If his wife died, who is more likely to succeed her than the young lady who had already, by all accounts, received presiding attentions from her employer? Love, fortune, power, all depending on one middle-aged life. Ugly, Watson. Very ugly. Yes, indeed, Holmes. 
Nor could she prove her alibi. On the contrary, she had to admit that she was down near the Thor Bridge. That was the scene of this tragedy, about that hour. She couldn't deny it, for some passing villager had seen her there. That seems final. And yet, Watson, and yet, this bridge, a single broad span of stone with the mustarded sides, carries the drive over the narrowest part of a long, deep, regirt sheet of water. A Thormare, it's called. In the mouth of the bridge lay a dead woman. Such are the facts. But here, if I mistake not, is our client considerably before this time. Billy had opened the door, and the man which he announced was an unexpected one. Mr. Marlowe Bates was a stranger to both of us. He was a thin, nervous wisp of a man with frightened eyes and a twitching, hesitated manner. A man whom my own professional eye would judge to be on the brink of an absolute nervous breakdown. You seem agitated, Mr. Bates, said Holmes. Pray sit down. I fear that I can only give you a short time, for I have an appointment at eleven. I know you have, a visitor gasped, shooting out a sentence like a man who was out of breath. Mr. Gibson is coming. Mr. Gibson is my employer. I am the manager of his estate, Mr. Holmes. He is a villain, and an infernal villain. Strong language, Mr. Bates. I have to be emphatic, Mr. Holmes, for the time is so limited. I would not have him find me here for the world. He is almost due now, but I am so situated that I could not come earlier. His secretary, Mr. Ferguson, told me this morning of his appointment with you. And are you his manager? I have given him notice. In a couple of weeks I shall have shaken off his accursed slavery. A hard man, Mr. Holmes, a hard to all about him. Those public charities are screened to cover his private inquities. But his wife was his chief victim. He was brutal to her. Yes, sir, brutal. How she came to her death I do not know, but I am sure that he had made her life misery to her. She was a creature of the tropics, a Brazilian by birth, as no doubt you know. No, it had escaped me. Tropical by birth and tropical by nature, a child of the sun and of passion. She had loved him as such women can love, but when her own physical charms had faded, I am told that they were once quite great, there was nothing to hold him. We all liked her and felt for her and hated him for the way he treated her. But he is plausible and cunning. That is all I can say to you. Don't take him at face value. There is more behind. Now I'll go. No, no, don't detain me. He is almost due. With a frightened look at the clock, our strange visitor literally ran to the door and disappeared. Well, well, said Holmes after an internal silence. Mr. Gibson seems to be a nice, loyal household. But the warning is a useful one. And now we can only wait till the man himself appears. Sharp at the hour, we heard a heavy step upon the stairs, and the famous millionaire was shown into the room. As I looked upon him, I understood not only the fears and dislike of his manager, but also the explanations which so many business rivals had heaped upon his head. If I were a sculptor and desired to idolize a successful man of affairs, iron of nerve and leathery of conscience, I should choose Mr. Neil Gibson as my model. His tall, gaunt, craggy figure had a suggestion of hunger and rapacity. An Abraham Lincoln keyed to the base he uses instead of high ones would give some idea of the man. His face might have been chiseled in granite, hard set, craggy, remorseless, and with deep lines upon it, the scars of many a crisis. Cold gray eyes looking shrewdly from under his bristling brows surveyed us each in turn. He bowed in perfunctory fashion to Holmes as he mentioned my name, and then with a masterful air of possession he drew a chair up to my companion and seated himself with his bony knees almost touching him. Let me say right here, Mr. Holmes, he began, that money is nothing to me in this case. You can burn it if it's any use to lighting you to the truth. 
This woman is innocent, and this woman has to be cleared, and it's up to you to do it. Name your figure. My professional co charges are f upon a fixed scale, said Holmes coldly. I do not vary them, save for when I remix them all together. Well, if dollars make any difference to you, think of the reputation. If you pull this off, every paper in England and America will be booming you. You'll be the talk of two continents. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. I do not think that I am in need of booming. It may surprise you to know that I prefer to work anonymously, and that it is the problem itself which attracts me. But we are wasting time. Let us get down to the facts. I think you will find all the main ones in the press reports. I don't know that I can add anything which will help you. But if there's anything you would wish more light upon, well, I'm here to give it. Well, there is just one point. What is it? What were the exact relations between you and Miss Dunbar? The Gold King gave a violent start and half rose from his chair. Then his massive calm came back to him. I suppose you're within your rights and maybe doing your duty in asking such a question, Mr. Holmes. We will agree to suppose so, said Holmes. And then I can assure you that our relations were entirely and always of those of employer towards a young lady to whom he never conversed with, or ever saw, save for when he, she was in the company of his children. Holmes rose from his chair. I'm a very re busy man, Mr. Gibson, said he, and I have no time to or taste for aimless conversations. I wish you a good morning. Our visitor had risen also, and its great loose figure towered over Holmes. There was an angry gleam from under those bristling brows, and a tinge of color in those sallow cheeks. What the devil do you mean by this, Mr. Holmes? Do you dismiss my case? Well, Mr. Gibson, at least I dismiss you. I should have thought my words were plain. Plain enough, but what's at the back of it? Raising the price on me, or afraid to tackle it, or what? I have the right to plain answer. Perhaps you have, said Holmes. I'll give you one. This case is quite sufficiently complicated to start with, without the further difficulty of false information. The meaning that I'll lie? Well, I was expressing it as delicately as I could, but if you insist upon the word, I will not contradict you. I sprang to my feet with the expression for the millionaire's face was fiendish in its intensity, and he had raised his great knotted fist. Holmes smiled languidly and reached his hand out for his pipe. Don't be noisy, Mr. Gibson. I find that after breakfast even the smallest argument is unsettling. I suggest that a stroll in the morning air and a little quiet thought will be greatly to your advantage. With a great effort to Gold King mastered his fury. I could not but admire him, for by extreme self-command he had turned in a minute from a hot flame of anger to frigid and contemptuous indifference. Well, it's your choice. I guess you ha know how to run your own business. I can't make you touch the case against your will. You've done yourself no good this morning, Mr. Holmes, for I have broken stronger men than you. No man ever crossed me and was better for it. So many have said so, and yet here I am, said Holmes, smiling. Good morning, Mr. Gibson. You have a good deal yet to learn. Our visitor made a noisy exit, but Holmes spoke in this imperturbable silence with dreamy eyes fixed upon his ceiling. Any views, Watson? he asked at last. Well, Holmes, I must confess that when I consider this as a man who would certainly brush any obstacle from his path, and when I remember that his wife may have been the obstacle of an object of dislike, as the man Bates plainly told us, it seems to me exactly, and to me also. But what were his relations with the governess, and how did you discover them? Bluff, Watson, bluff. When I considered the passionate, unconventional, unbusinesslike tone of his letter, and contrasted it with the self-contained manner and appearance, 
It was pretty clear that there was some deep emotion which centered upon the accursed woman rather than upon the victim. We've got to understand the exact relations of these three people, if we are to reach the truth. You saw the frontal attack which I made upon him, and how imperturbably he received it. Then I bluffed him by giving him the impression that I was absolutely certain, when in reality I was only extremely suspicious. Perhaps he will come back. He is sure to come back. He must come back. He can't leave it where it is. Ha! Isn't that the ring? Yes, there is his footstep. Well, Mr. Gibson, I was just saying to Dr. Watson that you were somewhat overdue. The Gold King had re-entered the room in a more chastened mood than he had left it. His wounded pride still showed on his resentful eyes, but his common sense had shown him that he must yield if he were to attain the end. I've been thinking it over, Mr. Holmes, and I feel that I have been hasty in taking your remarks amiss. You are justified in getting down to the facts, whatever they may be, and I thank the more of you for it. I can assure you, however, that the relationship between Miss Dunbar and me don't really touch this case. That is for me to decide, is it not? Yes, I guess that is so. You're like a surgeon who wants every symptom before he can give his diagnosis. Exactly, that expresses it. And it is only a patient who has an object in deceiving the surgeon who would conceal the facts of this case. That may be so, but you will admit, Mr. Holmes, that most men would shy off a bit when they're asked point blank if their relations with a woman may be, if there really is any serious feeling in the case. I guess most men have a little private reserve of their own in some corner of their souls where they don't welcome intruders, and you burst suddenly into it. But the object excuses you, since it was to try to save her. Well, the stakes are down and the reserve open, and you can explore where you will. What is it you want? The truth. The Gold King paused for a moment as one who marshals his thoughts. His grim, dark-lined face had become even sadder and more grave. I can give it to you in a very few words, Mr. Holmes. He said at last. There are some things that are painful as well as difficult to say, so I won't go deeper than is needful. I met my wife when I was gold hunting in Brazil. Maria Pinto was the daughter of the governor officially of Man Manaus. And she was very beautiful. I was young and ardent in those days, but even now, as I look back with colder blood and a more critical eye, I can see that she was a rare and wonderful in her beauty. It was a deep, rich nature, too. Passionate, wholehearted, tropical, ill-balanced, very different from the American woman I might have known. Well, to make a long story short, I loved her, and I married her. It was only when the romance had passed, and it lingered for years, that I realized that we had done nothing, absolutely nothing in common. My love faded. If hers had faded also, it might have been easier. But you know the wonderful way of women. Do what I might, nothing could turn her from me. If I have been harsh to her, even brutal, the some have said, it has been because I knew that if I could not kill her love, or if it turned to hate, it would be easier for both of us. But nothing changed her. She adored me in those English woods, and had adored me for twenty years ago on the banks of the Amazon. Do what I might, she was devoted as ever. Then came Miss Grace Dunbar. She answered her advertisement and became governess to our two children. Perhaps you have seen her portrait in the papers. The whole world has proclaimed that she is also a very beautiful woman. Now I make no pretense to be more moral than my neighbors, and I will admit to you that I could not live under the same roof with such a woman in, in daily contact with her without feeling a passionate regard for her. Do you blame me, Mr. Holmes? I do not blame you for feeling it. I blame you if you should have expressed it, since this young lady was in sense under your perfect protection. Well, maybe so, said the millionaire through the moment the reproof had brought the old angry gleam into his eyes. I'm not pretending to be any better than I am. 
I guess all my life I'd been the man that reached out with his hand for what he wanted, and I never wanted anything more than the love and possession of that woman, and I told her so. Oh, you did, did you? Holmes took, could look very formidable when he was so moved. I said to her that I would, could marry her, and I would, but that it was out of my power. I said that money was no object that could I could have to make her happy and comfortable would be done. Very generous, I'm sure, said Holmes with a sneer. See here, Mr. Holmes, I came to you on a question of evidence, not a question of morals. I'm not asking for your criticism. It is only to the young lady's sake that I touch your case at all, said Holmes sternly. I don't know that anything she accused of is really worse than what you have accused yourself and admitted to. That you have tried to ruin a defenseless girl who is under your roof. Some of you rich men have to be taught that all the world cannot be bribed in condoning to your offenses. To my surprise, the gold king took a reproof with equanimity. That's how I feel myself about it now. I thank God that my plans did not work out as I'd intended. She would have had none of it, and she wanted to leave the house instantly. Why did she not? Well, in the first place, others were dependent upon her, and there was no light matter to her to let them down by sacrificing her living. When I had sworn, as I did, that she would never be molested again, she consented to remain. But there was another reason given. She knew the influence she had over me. And that it was stronger than any influence in the world. And she wanted to make good use of it. How? Well, she knew something of my affairs. There are large homes. Large beyond the belief of an ordinary man. I can make or break, and it is usually break. It wasn't individuals only. It was communities, cities, even nations. Business is a hard game, and the weak go to the wall. I played the game all for what it was worth. I never squealed myself, and I never cared if the other fellow squealed. But she saw it different. I guess she was right. She believed and said that, for, that a fortune could, for one man... That was more than he needed should not be built on 10,000 ruined men who were left without the means of life. That was how she saw it, and I guess she could see past the dollars to something that was more lasting. She found that I listened to what she said, and she believed she was serving the world by influencing my actions, so she stayed. And then this came along. Can you throw any light upon that? The Gold King paused for a moment or more. His head sunk into his hands, lost in deep thought. It's very black against her, I can't deny that. And women lead an inward life and may do things beyond the judgment of a man. At first, I was so rattled and taken aback that I was all ready to think that she had been led away in some extraordinary fashion that was clean against her unusual nature. One explanation came into my head. I'll give it to you, Mr. Holmes, for what it's worth. There is no doubt that my wife was bitterly jealous. There is a soul jealousy that can be as frantic as a many body jealousy. And though my wife had no cause, and I think she understood this for the latter, she was aware that the English girl extended her influence upon my mind and my acts that she herself never had. It was an influence for good, and that did not mend the matter. She was crazy with hatred, and the heat of the Amazon was always in her blood. She might have planned to murder Miss Dunbar, or we will say to threaten her with a gun so that to frighten her into leaving us. Then there might have been a scuffle and the gun gone off and shot the woman who held it. That possibility had already occurred to me, said Holmes. Indeed, it is the only obvious alternative to the deliberate murder. But she utterly denies it. Well, that is not final, is it? One can understand that a woman placed in so awful position might hurry home still in her bewilderment holding the revolver. 
She might even throw it in her own clothes, hardly knowing what she was doing, and when it is found, she might try to lie her way out by total denial, since all explanation is impossible. What is against such opposition? Miss Dunbar herself. Well, perhaps. Holmes looked at his watch. I have no doubt that we can get the necessary permits this morning and reach Winchester by the evening train. When I have seen this young lady, it is very possible that I may be for more use of you than the matter. Although I cannot promise that my conclusions will necessarily be such as you desire. There was some delay in the official pass, and instead of reaching Winchester that day, we went down to Thorpe Place, the Hampshire estates of Mr. Neil Gibson. He did not accompany us himself, but we had the address of the Sergeant Coventry of the local police who had first examined into the affair. He was a tall, thin, and cadaverous man with a secretive and mysterious manner which conveyed the idea that he knew or suspected much more deal than he dared to say. He had a trick, too, of suddenly sinking his voice to a whisper as if he had come upon something of vital importance. Well, the information was usually commonplace enough. Behind these tricks of manner, he soon showed himself to be a decent, honest fellow who was not too proud to admit that he was out of his depth and would welcome any help. Anyhow, I'd rather have you than Scotland Yard, Mr. Holmes, said he. If the Yard gets called into the case and the local loses sole credit for the success and may be blamed for failure. Now, you play straight, or so I've heard. I need not appear in the matter at all, said Holmes, to the evident relief of a melancholy acquaintance. If I can clear it up, I don't ask to have my name mentioned. Well, that's very handsome of you, I'm sure. And your friend Dr. Watson can be trusted? I know. Now, Mr. Holmes, as we walk down to the place, there is one question. I should like to ask you. I'd breathe it to you, that no soul but you. He looked around as if he dared to utter the words. Don't you think there might be a case against Mr. Neil Gibson himself? I have been considering that. You've not seen Miss Dunbar. She is a wonderful fine woman in every way. He may as well have wished his wife out of the road, but these Americans are readier with pistols than our folk are, and it was his pistol, you know. Was that the clear they made out? Yes, sir. It was one of a pair that he had. One of a pair? Where's the other? Well, the gentleman has a lot of firearms of one sort and another. We never quite matched the particular pistol, but the box was made for two. Well, if it was a one of a pair, you should surely be able to match it. Well, we had them all laid out in the house, if you would like to take a care of look over them. <coughs> Perhaps later. I think we will walk down together and have a look at the scene of the tragedy. The conversation had taken place in the little front room of the Sergeant Coventry's humble cottage, which served as a local police station. A walk of half a mile or so across a windswept heath, all golden bronze with the fading ferns, brought us to the side gates opening into the grounds of Thor Place Estate. A path led us through the pheasant preserves, and then from a clearing we saw the widespread half-timbered house, half Tudor and half Gregorian, upon the crest of the hill. Beside us there was a long reedy pool, constricted in the center where the main carriage drive passed over a stony bridge, but swelling into small lakes on either side. Our guide paused at the mouth of the bridge, and he pointed to the ground. This is where Miss Gibson's body lay, and marked by that stone. <clears throat> I understand that you were there before it was moved. Yes, they sent for me at once. Who did? Mr. Gibson himself. The moment the alarm was given, he had rushed down with the others from the house, insisted that nothing should be moved until the police should have arrived. That was sensible. I gather from the newspaper report that the shot was fired from close quarters. Yes, sir, very close. Near the right temple. Just behind it, sir. How did the body lie? On the back, sir. No trace of a struggle. No marks. No weapon. The short note from Miss Dunbar was clutched in her left hand. Clutched, you say? 
Yes, sir, we can hardly open our fingers. That is of great importance. It excludes the idea that anyone could have placed the note there after the death in order to furnish a false clue. Dear me, the note, as I remember, was quite short. I will be at Thor Bridge at nine o'clock. Only received some time before, say one hour or two. Why then was this lady so clasping it in her left hand? Why should she carry it so carefully? Did she not need to refer to it in the interview? Does it not seem remarkable? We, yes, sir, as you put it, perhaps it does. I think she should like to sit quietly for a few minutes and think it out. He seated himself upon the stone ledge of the bridge, and I could see his quick gray eyes darting from their questioning glances in every direction. Suddenly he sprang up again and ran across the opposite parapet, wiping his lens from his pocket and began to examine the stonework. This is curious, said he. Yes, sir, we saw the chip on the ledge. I expect it's been done by some passerby. The stonework was gray, but at this point it showed white, for a space not larger than a sixpence. When examined closely, one could see that the surface was chipped, as by a sharp blue. It took some violence to do that, said Holmes thoughtfully. With this cane, he struck the ledge several times without leaving a mark. Yes, it was a hard knock. In a curious place, too. It was not from above, but from below, for you see that it is on the lower edge of the parapet. But it is at least fifteen feet from the body. Yes, it is fifteen feet from the body. I may have nothing to do with the matter, but it is a point worth noting. I do not think that there is anything more to learn here. There was no footsteps, you say. The grounds are iron hard, sir. There's no traces left at all. Then we can go. We'll go up to the house first and take a look over these weapons of which you speak. Then we shall get on to the Winchester, for I should desire to see Miss Dunbar before we go further. Mr. Neil Gibson had not returned from town, but we saw in the house the neurotic Mr. Bates, who had called upon us in the morning. He showed us with a sinister relish the formidable array of firearms of various shapes and sizes which his employer had accumulated in the course of his adventurous life. Mr. Gibson had his enemies, as anyone would expect him to know in the methods, said he. He sleeps with a loaded revolver on a bedside table. He is a man of violence, sir, and there are times when all of us are afraid of him. I am sure that this poor lady who has passed death has often been terrified. Did you ever witness physical violence towards him? No, I cannot say that, but I have heard words which were nearly as bad. Words of cold, cutting contempt, and even more than servants. One millionaire does not seem to shine in private life, remarked Holmes as we made our way to the station. Well, Watson, we have come on a good many facts, some of them new ones, and yet I seem some way from a conclusion. In spite of the very evident dislike which Mr. Bates has for his employer, I gather from him that when the alarm came, he was undoubtedly in his library. Dinner was over at 8.30, and how normal up to then. It is true that the alarm was somewhat late in the evening, but the tragedy certainly occurred about an hour named in the note. There is no evidence at all that Mr. Gibson has been out of doors since his return from town at five o'clock. On the other hand, Miss Dunbar, as I understand it, admits that she had made an appointment to see Mrs. Gibson at the bridge. Beyond this, she would say nothing, as her lawyer had advised her to reserve her defense. We have several very vital questions to ask that young lady, and in my mind it will not be easy until we have seen her. I must confess that this case would, not, would seem to me to be very black against her, if it were not for one thing. And what is that, Holmes? Finding the pistol in her wardrobe. Dear me, Holmes, I cried. That seemed to me to be the most damning incident of all. No, Watson. It had struck me even at the first perfunctory reading. It was very strange. And now I am in closer touch with the case. It is my only firm ground for hope. We must look for consistency. Where there is a want of it, we must suspect deception. 
I hardly follow you. Oh, now, Watson, suppose for a moment that we visualize you in a character of a woman who, in a cold, premeditated fashion, is about to get rid of her rival. You have planned it. A note has been written. The victim has come. You have your weapon. The crime is done. It was workmanlike and complete. Do you tell me that after carrying out so crafty a crime, you would now ruin your reputation as a criminal by forgetting to fling your weapon into those adjacent reed beds which would forever cover it? But you must need carry it carefully home and put it in your own wardrobe, the very place that would be searched. Your best friends would hardly call you a schemer, Watson, and yet I could not picture you doing anything so crude as that. <laughs> in the excitement of the moment. No, no, Watson. I will not admit that it is possible. Where a crime is cruelly premeditated, then the means of covering it are cruelly premeditated also. I hope, therefore, that we are in the presence of a serious misconception. But there is so much to explain. Well, we shall set about explaining it. Once your point of view is changed, the very thing was so damning becomes a clue to the truth. For example, there is this revolver, as Dunbar disclaims any knowledge of it. Our new theory is that she's speaking the truth when she says so. Therefore, it was placed in her wardrobe. Who placed it there? Someone who wished to incriminate her. Was that not the person, the actual criminal? You see how we come upon the, the most fruitful line of inquiry? We were compelled to spend the night at Winchester, as the formalities had not yet been completed. But the next morning, in the company of Miss, Mr. Joyce Cummings, the rising barrister from whom entrusted was the defense, we were allowed to see the young lady in her cell. I had expected from all that we had heard to see a beautiful woman, but I can never forget the effect which Miss Dunbar produced upon me. It was no wonder that even the masterful millionaire had found her something more powerful than himself, something which could not control or guide him. One felt, too, as one looked upon the strong, clear-cut, yet sensitive face, that even should she be capable of such impetuous deed, nonetheless there was an innate nobility of character which would make her influence always for the good. She was a brunette, tall, with a noble figure and commanding presence, but her dark eyes had in them the appalling helpless expression of a hunted creature who feels the nets around it, but can see no way out from the toils. Now, as she realized the presence and help of my famous friend, there came a touch of color to her wan cheeks, and a light of hope began to glimmer in the glance which she turned upon us. Perhaps Mr. Neil Gibson has told you something of what occurred between us? She asked in a low, agitated voice. Yes, Holmes answered. You need not pain yourself by entering into that part of the story. After seeing you, I am prepared to accept Mr. Gibson's statement, both as to the influence you had over him as to the innocence of your relations with him. But why was the whole situation not brought out in court? It seemed to me credible that such a charge would be sustained. I thought that if we waited, the whole thing must be clear itself without our being compelled to enter into painful details of the inner life of the family. But I understand that far from it clearing has become more serious. My dear young lady, Holmes cried earnestly, I beg you to have no illusions upon the point. Mr. Cummings here would assure you that all the carrots are present against us, and that we must do everything that is possible if we are to win clear. It would be a cruel deception to pretend that you are not in very great danger. Give me all the help that you can, then, to get to the truth. I will conceal nothing. Tell us, then, of your true relations with Mr. Gibson's wife. She hated me, Mr. Holmes. She hated me with all the fervor of her tropical nature. She was a woman who would do nothing by halves, and the measure of her love for her husband was the measure also of her hatred for me. 
It is possible that she misunderstood our relations. I would not wish to wrong her, but she loved so vividly in a physical sense that she could hardly understand the mental and even spiritual tie which held her husband to me. Or imagine that it was only my desire to influence his power to good ends which kept me under his roof. I can see now that I was wrong. Nothing could justify me in remaining there where I was this case of unhappiness. And yet it is certain that the unhappiness would have remained even if I had left the house. Now, Miss Dunbar, said Holmes, I beg you to tell us exactly what occurred that evening. I can tell you the truth so far as I know, Mr. Holmes, but I am in a position to prove nothing, and there are points, the most vital points, which I can neither explain, nor can I imagine any explanation. If you will find the facts, perhaps others will find the explanation. With regard, then, to my presence at Thorbridge that night, I received a note from Miss Gibson in the morning. It lay on the table in the schoolroom, and it was been there left for her own hand. It implored me to see her there after dinner, and said that she had something important to say to me, and asked me to leave the answer in the sundial in the gardens, as she desired no one to be in our confidence. I saw no reason for secrecy, but I did as she asked, accepting the appointment. She asked me to destroy her note, and I burned it in the school of great. She was very much afraid of her husband, who treated her with a harshness for which I frequently reproached him, and I could only imagine that she acted in this way because she did not wish him to know of our interview. Yet she kept your reply very carefully. Yes, I was surprised to hear that she had it in her hand when she died. Well, what happened? I went down as I had promised. When I reached the bridge, she was waiting for me. Never did I realize at that moment how this poor creature hated me. She was like a madwoman, indeed. I think she was a madwoman. Subtly mad with the deep power of deception which insane people may have. How else could she have met me with an unconcern every day and yet had such a hatred for me in her heart? I will not say what she did. She poured out her whole wild fury in the burning of the horrible words. I did not even answer. I could not. It was dreadful to see her. I put my hands to my ears and rushed away. Then I left her. She was standing still shrieking at her curses at me in the mouth of the bridge. Where she was afterwards found. Within a few yards from the spot. And yet, presuming that she did not meet her death shortly after you left her, you heard no shot. I heard nothing. But indeed, Mr. Holmes, I was so agitated and horrified by the terrible outbreak that I rushed to get back to the peace of my own room, and I was incapable of noticing anything which happened. You say that you returned to your room. Did you leave it again before the next morning? Yes, when the alarm came, that poor creature had met death, and I ran out with the others. Did you see Mr. Gibson? Yes, he had just returned from the bridge when I saw him. He had sent for the doctor and the police. Did he seem to you much perturbed? Mr. Gibson is a very strong, self-contained man. I do not think that he would ever show his emotions on the surface, but I, who knew him so well, could see that he was deeply concerned. Then we come to the all-important point, the pistol that was found in your room. Had you ever seen it before? Never, I swear it. When was it found? The next morning, when the police made their search. Among your clothes? Yes, on the floor of my wardrobe, under my dresses. You could not guess how long it had been there. It had not been there the morning before. How do you know? Because I tidied my wardrobe. That is final. Then someone came into your room and placed the pistol there in order to inculpate you. It must have been so. And when? 
It could have only been a meal time or else at the hours when I was in the schoolroom with the children. As you were when you got the note. Yes, from that time onwards in the whole morning. Thank you, Miss Dunbar. Is there any other point which m could help us with the investigation? I can think of none. There was some sign of violence from the stonework on the bridge. A freshly perfect, a perfect fresh chip just opposite the body. Could you suggest any possible explanation for that? Surely it must be a mere coincidence. Curious, Miss Mamba. Very curious. Why should it appear at the very time of the tragedy, uh, and why in the very place? But what could have caused it? No great violence could have such an effect. Holmes did not answer. His pale, eager face had suddenly resumed the tense, faraway expression which I had learned to associate with extreme manifestations of his genius. So evident it was this crisis of his mind that none of us dared to speak, and we sat, barrister, prisoner, and myself, watching him in concentrated and absorbed silence. Suddenly he sprang from his chair, vibrating with nervous energy and pressing need for action. Come, Watson, come, he cried. What is it, Holmes? Never mind, dear lady. You will hear from me. Mr. Cummings, with the help of God of justice, I will give you a case which will make England ring. You will get the news by tomorrow. Miss Dunbar, and meanwhile, take assurance that the clouds are lifting and that I have every hope that the light of truth is breaking through. It was a long, not a long journey from Winchester to Thorpe Place, and it was evident as long as the pee in my patience, while for Holmes it was evident that it seemed endless. For in his nervous restlessness he could not sit still. He paced the carriage and drummed with his long, sensitive fingers upon the cushions beside him. Suddenly, however, as we neared the destination, he seated himself opposite of me. We had a first-class carriage to ourselves, and laying his hand upon one of my knees, he looked into my eyes with a particularly mischievous gaze which had the characteristics of a more imp-like mood. Watson, he said, I have some recollection that you will go armed upon these excursions of ours. It was well for him that I did so, for he took little care for his own safety when his mind was once absorbed in a problem, so that more than once my revolver had been a good friend in need. I reminded him of this fact. Yes, yes, I'm a little absent-minded in such matters. But have you your revolver on you? I produced it from my hip pocket, a short, handy, but very serviceable little weapon. He undid the catch and shook out the cartridges and examined it with care. It's heavy, remarkably heavy, said he. Yes, it is a bit of solid work. He mused over it for a moment. Do you know, Watson, he said, I believe your revolver is going to have a very intimate connection with the mystery which we are investigating. My dear Holmes, are you joking? No, Watson, I am very serious. There is a test before us. If the test comes off, all will be clear. And the test will depend on the con conduct of this little weapon. One cartridge out. Now, we'll replace the other five and put on the safety catch. So, that increases the weight and makes it a better reproduction. I had a glimmer of what was in his mind, nor did he enlighten me. I had lost the thought until we pulled up into the little Hampshire station. We secured a ramshackle trap, and in a quarter of an hour we were at the house of our confidential friend, the sergeant. A clue, Mr. Holmes, what is it? It all depends upon the behavior of Mr. Watson's revolver, said my friend. Here it is. Now, officer, can you give me ten yards of string? The village shop provided us a full buy of stout twine. I think that this is all we need, said Holmes. Now, if you please, we will get off to what I hope is the last stage of our journey. The sun was setting and turning the rolling Hampshire moor into a wonderful autumn panorama. 
The sergeant, with many critical and intrigued glances, which showed his deep doubts of the sanity of my companion, lurched forward beside us. As we approached the scene of the crime, I could see that my friend, under all his habitual coolness, was in truth deeply agitated. Yes, he said, in answer to my remark. You have seen me miss my mark before, Watson. I have an instinct for such things, and yet it has sometimes played me false. It seemed a certainty when we first flashed my mind in the cell of Winchester. But one drawback of an active mind is that it can always conceive alternate explanations, which would make our scent a false one. And yet, and yet, well, Watson, we can try. As we walked, he had firmly tried one end of the string to the handle of the revolver. And now we reached the scene, the scene of the tragedy. With great care, I marked that under the guidance of the policeman, the exact spot where the body had been stretched. Then he hunted along the heather and the ferns until he found a considerable stone. This he secured to the other end of his line of string, and he hung it to the parapet of the bridge so that it swung clear above the water. Then he stood on the fatal spot, some distance from the edge of the bridge, with my revolver at his hand. The string pulled tight between the weapon and the heavy stone on the farther side. Now for it, he cried. At the words, he raised the pistol to his head and then let go of his grip. In an instant, it had been whisked away from the weight of the stone and had struck a sharp crack upon the parapet and had vanished over the side into the water. It had hardly gone before Holmes was kneeling beside the stonework, and a joyous cry showed that he had found what he expected. Was there ever a more exact demonstration, he cried. See, Watson, your revolver has solved the problem. As he spoke, he pointed to the second ship of the exact size and shape of the first, which had been appeared under the under ledge of the stone balustrade. We're set at the end tonight, he continued. As he rose, he... Haste and astonish sergeant. You will, of course, get a grappling hook, and you will restore my friend's revolver. You will also find beside it the revolver, string, and weight in which the vindictive woman attempted to disguise her own crime and fasten a charge of murder upon an innocent victim. You can let Mr. Gibson know that I will see him in the morning, when the steps can be taken for Miss Dunbar's vindication.'